Tonight I am joined by a very special guest and also a special friend. Raha Dixon is the Chief Executive Officer of Taylor Here, a company of tailors that collaborates with luxury brands to ensure their looks fit their A-list clients perfectly. With a law, journalism, and fashion background, Raha is passionate about creating content that receive, receives worldwide acclaim. She has worked as an editor, writer, and an on-air reporter for various media outlets covering music, fashion, entertainment, and pop culture. She has also interviewed celebrities and influ influencers like Rihanna, Zac Efron, and Angelina Jolie. Raha is the daughter of Nana's Hatami. Yeah, that's perfect. A visionary designer who has worked with world-renowned brands such as Valentino, Prada, and Yves Saint Laurent. Raha advocates for gender equality and justice, especially for women in Iran who face persecution and discrimination. She supports the Our Story is One campaign, which honors the 40th anniversary of the execution of 10 Baha'i women in Shiraz, Iran, who were hanged for their faith. Through Taylor Here and in collaboration with Avinity, she helped launch an exclusive shirt collection that pays tribute to the 10 Baha'i women and their unwavering spirit for the benefit of the Persia Educational Foundation and the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center. She hopes this collaboration will raise awareness and inspire action for the cause of gender equality and justice worldwide. Raha, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you, Farid. It's so nice to be here. Yes, it's very nice to be here. And actually, we're both wearing we uh, are t-shirts. Mine is fit, fitting me a little bit snug, but I, I really <laughs> like it. Uh, but I, we, that's what we're actually here to talk about tonight: yeah. is this project that you have started um, for with in collaboration with uh, the fashion label Avinity. Thank you to uh, bring awareness to these ten women who were killed for their faith. Yeah. Uh, 40 years ago and also as you'll add you know share with us there's a, there's a personal connection mm -hmm. for you but yeah just um first want to hear from you what was you know what inspired this idea what yeah. got you to, to make this project you know this these 10 women who were killed most of them were in their 20s i was six when i heard this news and as a six-year-old you don't really know much about death anyway mm -hmm. but then the idea that someone who's maybe 10 years older than you got killed because they put on a children's class was just so beyond belief for me. And two of the women I'm related to, one of them is my father's first cousin, Roya Ishrari, and one of them was her mother, uh, Ezzat, John Ami Ishrari, who's my dad's aunt. So she was married to Enayat, who is my grandmother's brother. I know this all sounds kind of far, but, nope. you know, it's my dad's mom uh, and her brother, his wife, and their daughter was killed uh, over the course of two days 40 years ago, and they were hung to death in a very public situation with people watching. Um, and so, really, their only crime was believing in gender equality, was believing in the unity of mankind, and uh, for being members of the Baha'i faith, but really... It's not anything new, as you know, and you were previously sharing, that when you believe in gender equality in Iran, you're going to get punished, unfortunately. And so they were in prison for 40 days, no visitors allowed, no one had any clue what was happening to them. And after seven months of being tortured and interrogated in such an awful way and being beaten and, you know, doing things like, um, hitting the soles of their feet, things that you just see in movies and you don't think it really happens. It happened and it happened not so long ago. And then, of course, again, 40 years later, for not covering, you know, her her head correctly, Masa Amini gets arrested and then beaten and then dies for the very same thing, believing in the fact that she can ch choose to show her hair if she wants. Um, you know, 40 years ago, these 10 women were arrested mainly for putting on classes for youth and providing marriage counseling to, you know, their peers. And that just wasn't allowed. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, one of them being roughly 10 years older than you at the time. Uh, yes. Mona Mahmoud Najjar. That's she was right. Just 17 years old. She was 17 yeah. years old and she had a children's class and that's why they arrested her. And I just think about when I was 17, I don't know if you think about when you were 17, I, 
I wouldn't even be able to stomach mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But to be relentlessly interrogated, beat, and told all you have to say is, I am not a member of this faith, and I believe everything you're telling me, and we will let you go home. And she didn't do that at 17. And, and she took everything they gave her. And in the end, she was so concerned for them because what they were doing was so wrong that she was praying for them. Mm. That I know what, what what's going to come of you once you leave this earth. You're not going to be happy because of these choices you made. I'm praying for you so you will be able to handle that suffering. Mm. What? Yeah. So about wise and the under years. Yeah. And these are the people we're celebrating. And Mona's right here on the t-shirt. Her yes. beautiful seventeen-year-old face. And of course, we're on the air, so people can't see the the shirt. <laughs> Sorry, no, I no, do. no. But you're, I mean, you're making it clear. The shirt has the pictures of these yes. women with their names, and then also the age they were when they were yes. killed. Many of them in their twenties, uh, or Mona was the youngest one at seventeen. That's right. Um, you know, I remember when you shared a bit about this story and mm. how. Although you were so young, you were heartbroken, and know. Uh, you know you shared a very—it's heartbreaking but sweet story of how you were—you <laughs> wanted to do something about it, but you were—you know—there were. You I know sure what did. To do. Yeah. So yeah, maybe you can share that story of the six-year-old uh, yes. marching. Yeah. I mean, I remember. So my grandmother was living with us at the time, and we heard—we got a call at six a.m. Mm. She heard that her brother was killed, and then we drove to you know his son's house, who was living not so far from us in Texas at the time. And then by the time we got there, she received a call that his wife and daughter had been killed and she suffered a mini stroke. And we had to handle that. This enraged me. I couldn't believe that people could just be killed for nothing. So I said, I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna march on the streets with a big sign by myself. And my parents were like, you cannot do that. This is <laughs> 1983. Living, and this where are you living at Houston, time? Texas. Okay. Yeah. We are not doing that, Roja. And so I said, well, I'm gonna do it in my house. So I made a sign <laughs> and I was marching around the house oh. as a six year old and really at the top of my lungs screaming, please stop killing these people. And I, for some reason, I felt like if I said it loud, they could hear me mm -hmm. or something could hear me and would be able to do something in my little six-year-old brain. Um, but the other thing that was happening at the time, my brother had just been born and my mom had given birth maybe a few months before that. So she was breastfeeding and she took my grandma to the doctor and the doctor said to her, she suffered a mini stroke, and this is purely from fear and anxiety that, that she has no idea what's gonna come next. If you don't help her to lose something like 40 pounds immediately, she's gonna have another stroke, no question. And we have no idea how if it's gonna be fatal or not. So my mom says to the doctor, can you do me a favor and tell her that I'm the one that needs to lose weight and she needs to help me do that because I think if you do that then she'll she'll feel like she's helping someone and she'll mm -hmm. go to action so of course they did that she says to, to my grandmother you know I told them about you and then the doctor looked at me and said whoa mm -hmm. you need to lose <laughs> weight uh, you need to go on a diet and have kadu au paz which is like squash <laughs> cooked with boiled water which is not very tasty without oil lemon or salt um, and so Immediately, my grandma forgets everything that's happening and says, I'm going to help you do that. Mm -hmm. So she cooked no salt, no oil, no nothing. And of course, my mother's breastfeeding, so she really did need the calories. So she used to quietly like go into the fridge <laughs> at midnight and eat food so that my grandmother wouldn't see. So my grandmother lost the 40 pounds, but my mother lost almost nothing. Yeah, yeah. For good reason that she was feeding <laughs> she someone, herself was at someone else, but yeah. But it was just such a beautiful, exactly. and really speaks to that generation and how when someone else needed something, yeah. they would drop everything and do it. And it was the same spirit of her brother who was in prison and the wife and the daughter. They were all like that. Mm. You know, you, you spoke about that six-year-old you and how, yeah. oh, you're, you know, thought maybe if you say it loud enough, it makes, you know, yeah. someone will hear it. And maybe they likely did not hear that, but people are going to hear what you're doing now. So your voice is still being heard, right? You're <laughs> making you. sure your voice is heard. And this is something I've talked about since last year. I mean, other times too, yeah. especially with what's been happening in Iran, that we can do a lot more than we think. Totally. And sometimes it's in creative ways or not the most straightforward of ways to 
do something that brings awareness yeah. to people who have suffered, who are yeah. continuing to suffer, and that something needs to change. So I'm sure that six-year-old you would be very proud of you for <laughs> oh. what you're doing now, that you created this project to bring awareness to yeah. family members and others who were killed at that time. And again, it brings light to not just these 10 individuals who deserve a lot of attention and recognition, right. but everyone else who has suffered and continues to suffer. 100%. And anyone who would like to uh, purchase one, you can go to avinity.co, A-V-I-N-I-T-I.co, not com, co. Yes, um, and the first t-shirt there you'll see is the one um, that you can purchase. But it's really, what really bothers me about this is that there's absolutely no recourse. There's no legal system that can help even a broken one. Like there's absolutely nothing. When these people were killed, these women were killed, their family members begged to go see their bodies, just to see the bodies because they were told, you're not going to get to have a burial. You're not going to get the body. We're going to keep the body. We're going to handle them. And, that, and so just to see a glimpse of a dead body of their mother or their sister is, is what they, they begged for. No legal counsel, no burial, no funeral. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have a memorial. Are you kidding? They would arrest everyone who was at the memorial. And it's the same for Massa. I mean, and many others like her. There's a killing and there's an injustice and there's absolutely nothing you can do. There's no court that's going to listen. Well, the, the, the law is... Left, right. That's the that's the unfortunate thing, which is why you know people want a revolution. Is that people in power yeah. who are creating law and justice are doing it in such an unfair, unfair way. I've yeah. I've heard stories of just even recently where people, their loved ones have died or have been killed or something has happened, and they either don't. They say you definitely can't see the body, yeah. or they say we'll you, we'll charge you, or if you want like kind of a bribe, then we'll give you access or something. You know, there's all these things that are still happening to this day, which is you know heartbreaking and. What we're bringing attention yeah. to and um i do want to mention because you mentioned the shirts yes uh, yes. yes thank you but also to, to bring awareness to you know the money go towards two very important yes. organizations that are relevant when we talk about this fight for justice in iran and you can talk about yes that. absolutely the persia education foundation uh, per, sorry persia educational foundation and they provide scholarships for uh, Iranians outside of Iran, and they're actually just putting together their U.S. arm. They're U.K.-based, but they're starting in the U.S., which is really exciting, mm -hmm. because a lot of, you know, young youth leave Iran with the hopes of coming to America, starting a new life, which is really difficult, and, you know, schooling here is not cheap, so they're helping people get an education when they finally are able to get out of the country and come. Yeah. And then the other uh, charity is the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, and they document all the injustices that occur in Iran. So if there's somewhere where it says this happened and this is what we know about it. And it's just a it's a huge resource to help keep them accountable, as yeah. you said. Yeah, I, I think um, Gisu Mia, who I had on the show last year, Correct. she's an attorney and she does a lot when it comes to bringing awareness to what's happening in Iran and, and yeah. taking action. And I remember her speaking on this. And we were talking, I couldn't remember if she worked there. She definitely knows, mentioned this, but that the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, yeah, it's a very important resource to very. keep track of and then to keep accountable uh, the government yeah. of Iran for the human rights violations that unfortunately are happening on a, a daily basis. Right, exactly. And so that's important. So I think it's wonderful that you are, um, all the, all the money that's raised goes towards these Yes, all the profits raised goes towards these organizations. We really want to support them as much yes. as we can. And this was the only way I could think of, you know, because I'm in this fashion world. And, you know, one of my friends, Tahira Danish, said, hey, why don't you design a T-shirt? And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. well, why don't I do that? Um, and I was just thinking about it. And then I remembered one of my friends is starting a line and it's called Avinity. And he offered to, you know, allow us to use his website. So it all just organically happened, which is another sign that it's right. You know? Well, it, it, yeah, I would say it's another sign that it's right. But I think I don't want to, maybe you were doing it with humility, like undermine that you have to take some action. I say that to anyone sure. listening, myself included, you know, thinking of what can I do? Because yeah, yeah it's organic, but you have to kind of set, you know, you have to plant the seed to set it in motion for totally. someone to grow from it. So you took those steps and, you know, put it out there and then people reached out and then you made something. I So I hope people will, 
keep that in mind that, okay, what can I do? Yeah. doesn't mean you have to design a t-shirt. You can. Very cool idea. And I think that's great. But what is it that you, know, you have as far as your resources, talents, abilities that you can bring awareness to yeah. uh, what's happening in the injustices that are happening there? I've heard lots of great stories of people that have so created many. different campaigns and things that um, yeah. you know are really important. So after the break, I'll continue the discussion with Rob right. Dixon. Again, you can go to uh, avinity.co, that's A-V-I-N-I-T-I dot C-O, to order your own t-shirt. Uh, we'll have more after the break. And creating these t-shirts to uh, remember these 10 women who were killed in Iran 40 years ago just for their uh, faith, religious belief. And we're seeing in Iran people, uh, you know, you sent me an article actually, which I thought was quite fascinating yeah. about seeing, you know, there are Baha'is and there's other religious minorities that have been persecuted, mm -hmm. but also um, Masa, I mean, he was Kurdish, and the Kurdish, as long, uh, along with other minority groups in Iran, have been heavily persecuted throughout um, these last 44 years and continuing on to the present day. And of course, it's not just certain groups. All people have been subject to the injustices there, but some groups have been particularly targeted in different times and in different ways. But um, one of the things we talked about during the break, which I think I mentioned about the shirt, mm -hmm. but you've also shared that, you know, we're talking about how it's so important to remember, we hear 10 people killed or this many people right. killed, and it's easy for that to turn into a statistic and a number, but right. that's why it's so important, the pictures and the stories. Yeah. And you were saying there's a website, I think you're saying that yes. has the stories of these so women. So my cousin Sheila Ishrari, well, I call her my cousin, but really her father is my father's first cousin and her father, uh, is the son of Inayat and Ezat. So mm. she's the granddaughter of this, these beautiful, this beautiful couple who were executed. She created a website for all the cousins, uh, the sorry, the siblings. So there's Vahid, Nahid, and Rosita, who's still in Iran, and Saeed. Um, they're the kids that remained when their, their mother, father, and their sister were executed. So she created this website, orangeblossomdreams.com, for the siblings to sort of all the stories they had told over time they felt like we're getting old we don't know how to put this somewhere where it'll live on so she created a beautiful website with pictures and stories mm -hmm. and anecdotes and you can actually if you know them or know someone who knows them you can actually press a button and send your story to them and they can publish that there too and I just think that's so great because some of the things she says like Enayat um, he kept a picture of Sheila and Arash his two grandkids at the time, on his pillow next to his face when he was in prison. And, you know, she said, that just broke me when, when I read that. And Rosie actually got engaged while her parents were in prison and her sister was in prison. And she went to visit them, and she went to visit her mom and sister to tell them, I just found out that dad was executed. And her sister says, wait, I see a ring on your finger. Show us your beautiful ring. Oh, my goodness, you're engaged. And she has this joyful. And Rosita, you know, you read in the website, she says, I don't understand this steadfastness. How were they so strong? How were they so happy? I couldn't stomach it. But they, it really gives you a sense that there's so much pain and so much anguish for the people that are left behind and for their kids mm -hmm. and perhaps even their kids' kids. I mean, now we have a lot of help and mental health has become, you know, something that it's not, doesn't have a stigma attached to it anymore and we can get help when we need it. But at that time, it really wasn't a thing. No one really even knew what trauma was if it hits you in the face. Mm -hmm. I mean, my dad used to say when he was five, he remembers an incident where bricks were being thrown in the house at him and, and one of them passed his head and he thought, oh, I could have just died. And that's at five. Mm. You know, that kind of impact, and it doesn't leave you unless you, even if you get help, it's something that you just live with and cope with and find ways to manage, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think what you said is so important. Each person that gets killed, all these 10 women, their mothers, their fathers, they had to go to prison and look through a glass. I mean, I'm using my hands. Nobody can even see me. But they had to speak through a glass window to speak to their relatives and then they didn't know if this was going to be the last time they were going to see them or not and this still happens today i mean masa amini was visiting a family member in iran and nobody had any clue 
that she was going to be taken, then beaten, and then they just thought, oh, we'll see her. In, they said they're going to see her in an hour, I think. And next thing they know, she's gone. Yeah, I think one of the things she said was, like, I don't have anyone here. Some, I forgot, I mean, Farsi. Yeah. And then people have written out, like, now you have everyone. You know, everyone is your brother and your sister uh, having supporting you, having yeah. you back. But I think what you shared was even extending what I said about let's not forget these individuals, mm -hmm. not lose them the statistics. But as you said, you know, I'm reminded of... Um, Kevin Hines, I, he, mm -hmm. he was on the show years ago. He jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge. He survived. Thanks. Wow. So, but he worked on a documentary mm. um, called The Ripple Effect, which was talking about like which mm. each suicide, sadly, like, there's a ripple effect. That's oh. not, of course, the tragedy of losing that life, yeah. but the ones, you know, the ripple effect that happens. And as you're saying, yeah, this type of trauma, um, even with help, I mean, you know, oh, maybe it can make it less bad, but it's still... Right so intense we, you know even we see things like intergenerational trauma how these things totally, get passed down totally. um because it's just you know it has such a huge impact and so yeah. you're right it's not and that's and that's something i feel when i've talked to people who especially if they've been to mm. iran everyone has yeah. even if they just visited has a store has stories of either something they directly faced you know with the morality wow. police or yeah. sur, you know surrounding types of apparatus or family members friends that have experienced something horrific yeah. And everyone has a story, so they're all impacted, and it, it just is not something that just affects a select few no, people. No, it's not. But as you mentioned, that ripple effect of people who have been right. impacted by what Kevin Hines, I, he, mm -hmm. he was on the show years ago, he jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge, he survived. Thanks. Wow. So, but he worked on a documentary mm. um, called The Ripple Effect, which was talking about like which mm. each suicide, sadly, like, there's a ripple effect. That's oh. not, of course the tragedy of losing that life, yeah. but the ones, you know, the ripple effect that happens. And as you're saying, yeah, this type of trauma, um, even with help, I mean, you know, oh, maybe it can make it less bad, but it's still right. so intense. And we, you know, even we see things like intergenerational trauma, how these things totally. get passed down totally. um, because it's just, you know, it has such a huge impact. And so yeah. you're right. It's not, and that's, and that's something I feel when I've talked to people who, especially if they've been to mm. Iran, everyone has, yeah. Even if they just visit it, has a sto has stories of either something they directly faced, you know, with the morality uh, police or yeah. sur you know surrounding types of apparatus, or family members, friends that have experienced something horrific, yeah. and everyone has a story, so they're all impacted, and it, it just is not something that just affects a select few no, people. It's not. But as you mentioned, that ripple effect of people who have been right. impacted by what's happened here um, and continues to happen is really heartbreaking. It's terrifying. I mean, I know all the details of this particular story. Yeah. And so Rosita was 17. She was the only sibling that was in Iran alone at the time. She got engaged and her mother said to her, I'm so happy you're engaged because mm -hmm. now I know you're going to be safe and you're not going to be alone. That was the big fear. But they took her home. She did. She was the heir to the home for, of her parents. But the house was seized. She didn't get it. She didn't even get a trial to be able to say, hey, this is this belongs to me. Uh, you know, you just think about that. You're 17. You lose your house. You lose your family. You have this one person that you're marrying and no support to set up your life. I mean, that's that's so hard. I mean, with all the support in the world, setting up a life is hard. But to do it surrounded by fear and, you know, her and her husband have been in prison many times. They just kind of come and collect them just to mess with them and then let them go back home. And this happens to so many people, but it's just, there's so much that gets impacted. They have kids and now their kids have kids. And so there's no fun, let's do this with our grandma and grandpa. There's none of that. You miss out on a, on a huge chunk of life. And similar to what you were saying about suicide, you know, I, I heard about a teen suicide recently and I just thought to myself, how does that mother pack up that bedroom? Every year for the rest of her life, she has to face the reality that her, her child is gone. And what would have happened in this year? And what would have happened in that year? And every wedding you go to, and every graduation you go to, it's like it doesn't ever leave you. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrilled to just do a tiny, tiny little thing that we can remember these people, their families, and the people that came after them to just say, we remember you, and we're going to support in some kind of way. Yeah, and it's all of us doing, you know, you, you said it's tiny, but our part, whatever it is. And yeah. together, you know, um, I mentioned this Friday, because, you know, the protests on Saturday, 
you know, and again, everyone, we can do different types of things that make an impact. But each yeah. each small step might feel like it's not doing much, but everyone together doing something and doing their responsibility, whatever that means yeah. to them. That's what really we, we all want to do. And I think that's it's wonderful that you took this one yourself to, to do this. And, you know, another um, issue we talked about earlier today off the air, or I mean yesterday, mm -hmm. I think it was, but about the, you know, he said morale, uh, the issues of morality yes. is brought up against the people or the will of the people or whatever. They have these fancy ways of basically saying nothing of right. what the people are accused of crimes of, but really it's just they're trying to take, they're afraid of losing their power, right? right. So we see these people who have influence often in a very positive way, right. like you're saying, teaching classes for yeah. children. Other people have done wonderful things that they then yeah. get arrested for because the whole thing is the fear of losing power not the yeah. fear of you know not for doing good unfortunately so you're saying about the legal system you know the legal system is not about justice it's about power no, it's 100 yeah. percent about power and the irony is that i think what they are resisting will persist i think that fear that they will lose power of course it's going to happen because you're acting in such a inhumane way mm -hmm. that the entire world has now you know the children human rights act came about because of what happened to these 10 women in, in the 80s and eventually I really do have hope that they're not going to last because that kind of the world is just not going to allow it at some point enough will be enough and so who did that they did what if they could have embraced anyone with a different view what if they could have just lovingly said you know what we prefer that you wear this hijab but if you choose not to that's okay what a powerful, huge thing that would be. Imagine if that happened. Of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm totally with you, like, <laughs> if that would happen. But I think it's basically that's what their power is based on, 100%. right? Unfortunately, power is based on controlling yeah. and creating fear. And so if you give people, if you yeah. take that fear away or you take away that control, right. you fear losing control. So, yeah, it's unfortunate the whole system is based on... Um, hurting the people that you're supposed to be serving. And this totally. is something we, we see, and you know, you know, it happens around the world or in different ways it happens. We're seeing it so much in Iran, but mm. the people, I would, you know, the people who have power, you should seek power. Unfortunately, people that seek power usually want it for themselves rather right. than power to serve or right. power as a responsibility. Just like a teacher should have some power in the classroom in the sense that they have authority. Right. But that power should be to serve the students mm -hmm. and what's best for them, not 100%. give me attention, not give me benefits. And right. so what we're seeing in Iran, I think, is that times a thousand where it's just yeah. it's only about holding on to the power because, of course, that gives them control, gives them the money, give them all the things that they want. Yeah. And it's not about the people. And as you said, eventually that is going to dry up and the people, you know, overcome that. But we, we don't know when. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Me too. With you that I hopeful for a change. I haven't lost hope. I saw an article recently mm. and I heard there's some controversy around it, but I think it was about hope and maybe when to give up hope with what's happening in Iran. And I think oh. that was, but, but it seems that that might have been, you know, I don't want to get into the details. Right. I don't know enough research to talk right. about that. Yeah. But uh, I hope we don't lose hope, you know, because I, I think too. we will, yeah, we need to not give up on what's happening uh, for the people there. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think what you're doing is, as you said, doing your part of it. And we all have to continue to do our part yeah. Um, supporting one of ways, bringing attention. You know, it's been a year since mm -hmm. Masa Amini, and I know it's been 44 years since this revolution, sure. and I know people sometimes will lose hope because they think, well, it's been a year, nothing happened. But, right. um, you know, uh, something I try to remember is when we say the 1979 revolution, mm -hmm. it didn't happen just in 1979. No. Things were building up for years, and even Correct. certain types of factors for decades or even longer when you look at Iran's you know, history. So yeah. we don't want to be you know, um, lose motivation because of that, that we think, well, nothing's right. happened. Nothing's happened yet or nothing that we see. You know, there's a, a nice quote about revolutions that revolutions seem impossible until mm -hmm. they seem inevitable, which is like, it seems like it's never going to happen. Yes. And then one day it's like, well, how could it not? And yeah. it's not clear what, what gets gets there. But I saw people, of course, I'm talking to people outside of Iran. Right. I can never speak on behalf <laughs> of anyone inside of Iran, but I hope we'll continue to do what we can to Absolutely. support uh, our sisters and brothers there. I mean, the one thing I know about the people in Iran is that they're all coming together. Like, the differences that may have existed between the Kurdish community and this community, and that, well, that's all gone. They're all standing together in, in solidarity and saying, our story is one, which is essentially the name of this campaign. But also, people are... My death is better than my life. I'm going to go out there. I'd rather get a bullet 
then continue living like this. And then enough people do that, and there's no yeah. one left. So well, you know, what are you going to do with your power when nobody's left? Well, and what you know, you know, you're bringing attention to these ten women who who did that, and people, yeah. the incredible courage of the people in Iran, and what they've continued to do and show is, is remarkable, and something that uh, you can never know what you would do in. A, uh, if you're in another situation, but I can't imagine having the courage of these individuals. And Me so, either. Um, uh, yeah, we are very appreciative of them, and that's why I can never speak on what they can or should or shouldn't you're do right. because it's so. I impossible. hope I didn't do that. No, Did I didn't. Do that? Okay. Um, because it's so you know, Ooh. it's impossible to know what it'd be like yeah. uh, there. But coming back just to, to wrap things up because we're at the end of our time for tonight. Um, I hope everyone will do whatever they can to bring yes. attention to do it in their own way. There's so many ways and ways that we haven't thought of. Um, but so thank you to you, Raha, for what thank you're you. doing with Avinity. Again, I A V I N I T I dot C O. Thank Hope you. you'll pick up your t shirts there and support this great cause. And uh, a big thank you to you for doing that, but also for joining me on the show tonight. It's been a pleasure. I love talking to you anyway. Yeah. So.